Hey everybody, welcome back once again, CISSP wannabes. Um, you guys are prepping for your CISSP exam. I'm trying to help you make that happen. So I come at you with two questions to help prepare. And I am, if, as if you didn't already know, Colin Weaver, IT Dojo, CISSP questions of the day. Here comes question number one. All of the following should be determined during a business impact assessment, except one of these. Which one is it? Click on pause, read through those choices. When you got it right, click play. We can work it out. Okay, if you chose the first answer choice, you would have chosen the correct answer choice. Uh, going in and choosing the backup strategies or identifying the backup strategies is not part of a business impact assessment. Uh, that falls more into the purview of, say, continuity of operations or something like that, which comes you know, later. Uh, but the business impact assessment does not go in and do that. That means that all the other answers are things that the business impact assessment should do. Um, but the first one is what it should not do or does not do. Again, the gist of a business impact assessment is that it's going to go in and you know, identify what systems and processes are critical to what business processes and how they help achieve the mission and what the impact would be if those things were to become unavailable. Uh, more so, it goes in and identifies which resources would need to be available in order to get the systems, you know, functioning again. And takes time to go in and quantify those types of measures with things like maximum tolerable downtime, recovery time objectives, and recovery point objectives, so that we can know just how long we can endure a particular system being unavailable before harm is done to the organization. Harm in the form of financial loss, harm in the form of reputational loss, harm in, harm in the form of you know, something that's SLA oriented uh, with the service level agreement. Uh, but uh, once we know what the answers to these questions are, it can help us then go in and, and in essence create a triage so we know which things need to be addressed first or which things are gonna need to, are more severe, more sensitive uh, as far as making sure that they um, either A, don't go down in the first place or B, if they do go down, that we get them back up and running as quickly as possible. All right, here comes question number two. Which of the following is a characteristic of both TCP and UDP? Um, there are two correct answers that you can choose. Uh, please find both of them. Click pause if you need to, and then we can work it all out. Answer choice number one says that both TCP and UDP used uh, acknowledgement numbers, sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers, and that is inaccurate. Uh, TCP uses sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. UDP, however, does not. UDP, again, as I suspect you, if not, if you don't know, you should know, um, just packages the data up and ships it off and hopes for the best, whereas TCP, being a connection-oriented protocol, is endeavoring to make sure that all the pieces are individually numbered and that we can request the retransmission of missing pieces, et cetera, and that's part of what sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers are going to facilitate. And UDP does not bring any of that stuff to the table. Only TCP does. Choice number two says that both of them can carry DNS payloads, and that is actually true. Um, more often than not, people associate DNS as being a UDP-based protocol, but DNS can also be TCP-based. Most name resolution that we do day in, day out, as you go out and putter about the internet and go to websites and do different things, you're sending UDP-based DNS queries to the DNS server to get name resolution. So, you know, resolving, you know, www.whatever.com to an IP address or finding the, uh, the name of a mail server or finding the name of a DNS server or getting a DCAM record from, for sending, you know, a digitally signed mail, any of those kinds of things, those things are all done via UDP. Um, zone transfers, however, which are transfers of zone file information between DNS servers, um, that stuff is done using TCP. Uh, the other place where you could see TCP being used uh, for UDP-based communications would actually be uh, with uh, DNSSEC. So uh, even though DNSSEC is not hugely widely deployed, it could be um, uh, implemented there as well. So uh, that is one of the right answers here. Choice number three says that both TCP and UDP implement windowing. That is wrong. Okay, only TCP implements windowing. Okay, windowing is a mechanism built into TCP that allows it to have some control over the total quantity of outstanding data that it has at any particular moment in time. It has a, a, a window that can either be full of data or emptied out, and if the window is full, then no more data can be transmitted. 
Um, and UDP does not do any of that. Okay, again, UDP just sends the junk out and it gets there or done. But TCP, you know, really goes the extra mile to try and love that data to make sure it's gonna get through. And windowing along with sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers are some of the mechanisms that it's gonna to use to facilitate that. How about they both implement a header checksum? Yes, both TCP and UDP in the header have a checksum that checks the integrity of the rest of the data in the header. Um, the checksums that are in TCP and UDP headers do not check the integrity of the payloads, they just didn't check the integrity of the header. Um, the only real place that you could see where this whole header conversation comes up, that's not the only place, but the most common place, is actually with IP, the Internet Protocol. In IP version 4, there is a header checksum. In IP version 6, there is not. However, with TCP and UDP, regardless of whether it is IP version 4 or IP version 6, the header checksum still exists within both of those headers. Uh, again, TCP and UDP. All right, well, we've got two right answers, so the last one can't be right. And the last one says that they're using, they both use control bits to control connection states. Negative, that is a TCP thing. Uh, the control bits or code bits, as they're sometimes referred to, are those little bit positions that can go in and specify the state of the connection, like the send bit is set, or the uh, push bit is set, or the act bit is set, or the fin bit is set. Um, those are used to really just provide control over, hey, where are we in this conversation? Is this the beginning of a conversation? Are we actively transmitting data to one another? Or are we in the process of terminating this connection and hanging up with one another? Um, those code bits go in and provide that. They do some more stuff than that, but that's good enough for right now. Um, and that's it. Cool. Two more questions down. Again, I hope you like these. So I need to know. Tell me so. And I'll come back soon. See you. Thank you.